It is now my greatest, greatest honor and greatest pleasure to introduce our next uh, keynote speaker. We are incredibly, incredibly lucky to have Professor Robin Banerjee joining us uh, from the UK uh, for our next uh, keynote. Um, I first met um, Robin when he very, very kindly invited me many years ago to lead a session um, in Stanmore Park, which is a beautiful part of, uh, of England, um, when he was doing a study about the impact that families can have uh, on uh, children's lives and the link between school, between child um, families and the school, that triangular relationship has always been a really, really keen interest of mine. And it was wonderful to be part of that, uh, of that day and meet Robin. And since then, um, I've been inspired by his, by all his work uh, so, so much. So it's a great honor to, uh, to have you here, Robin. Uh, professor Robin Banerjee uh, is a professor of developmental psychology and the inaugural Pro Vice Chancellor for Global and Civic Engagement at the University of Sussex. Uh, Robin um, was formerly the head of the School of Psychology, which is a really, really fantastic uh, department at Sussex. And his research focused on the social and emotional development of young people. And he works very closely with practitioners and policymakers in the areas of education and mental health. He incredibly, he founded the Sussex Centre for Research on Kindness. So you can see why we're so pleased to have Robin here today, which is an interdisciplinary research centre focused on illuminating the nature of kindness and its impact on people and community. And even more incredibly, Professor Banerjee recently led the kindness test, which maybe a lot of you would have heard of, because it got global coverage, which was a partnership with the BBC that became the world's largest ever public science project on kindness. Um, he's also an expert advisor to the Empathy Lab, um, an organization that works with schools, libraries, and other community stakeholders to promote empathy and reading for pleasure through the power of children's books. We can't tell you, Robin, how pleased and honored we are. We know how incredibly busy you are, and we know that today is the launch of the Brighton Festival um, in Brighton, where we are uh, from, and I know you're incredibly busy with lots of the activities around there. So thank you so much for being with us today, taking the time, and very warm welcome to the sixth annual Global Empathy Conference. Thank you so much, Marcelo. It's a great pleasure to be joining you. Can I just check that you can all hear me okay? Perfect. Fantastic. Um, I'm sorry that I'm not there with all of you in person, but it's a great pleasure to be joining you today and to be talking about empathy. Thank you so much for your kind introduction, Marcelo. I'm going to share my screen now so that you can just see my slides. Let's see whether that works. Does that work, everyone? Can you see my slides? Perfect. So I'm going to be talking about empathy and kindness in context, and I'm specifically talking about a relational context. We're going to be talking about social relationships and how that connects with mental health and well-being in schools. And I think empathy and kindness are right at the heart of this. So my interests in psychology are in particularly the context of children and young people's mental health and well-being. And in order to understand mental health and well-being, I think it's very crucial to place those concepts within a relational context. Social relationships are absolutely fundamental to mental health and well-being. And that might seem very obvious to you. Of course, it makes a difference. How you're getting on with other people makes a difference to how you feel. And that's the same for children, just as it is for adults. But it's actually quite remarkable how very often we individualize mental health and well-being. We treat mental health and well-being almost as if they're properties of the individual, as if they are things that reside inside a child or a young person or adult's head. So the task very often when we're focusing on mental health and well-being in schools ends up being 
let's identify who has got mental health difficulties, who has got problems, and then figure out what we're going to do to fix that child or fix that person. And you know what, what's really interesting, of course, is that mental health and well-being don't simply reside inside an individual's head. Mental health and well-being are properties not of the child in a vacuum, but actually of the child in a deeply relational context. In order to understand mental health and well-being, we need to understand the network of relationships within which that young person is operating. And that leads to a fundamentally different way of thinking, because actually very often the solution is not fix the child, it's not fix the person or fix the individual. The solution very often is fix the environment, work with the relational network, work with the environment that is playing such an important role in that individual's mental health and well-being. And once you take that relational perspective, you can now make the link that you described so eloquently, Marcelo, you can make the link to this, to academic engagement, participation in the classroom, and of course, ultimately to achievement outcomes as well. Very often we have a uh, we have a strange and false dichotomy between social relationships and well-being on the one hand and academic engagement and achievement on the other and actually what's on the bottom of this screen the academic side is deeply deeply connected to what's on the top of the screen the mental health the well-being and social relationships because of course the classroom the educational context is a deeply social one relationships matter and in order to understand how the young person is progressing in their academic lives, we need to understand what's going on in their mental health, their well-being, and fundamentally their social lives as well. Now, I spend a lot of time mapping out relationships. This is a year five classroom in the UK. These children are all aged nine to 10 years old. Um, the names are made up, so... Uh, um, that's that's that, that's all made up, but it's uh, real data, and these arrows indicate who children say they most like to hang out with. It's very simple to generate this so-called sociogram. You ask kids who you most like to hang out with, and you can see some kids like Nadia here have a lot of arrows pointing to her. You can see that Nadia is very popular. Lots of kids want to hang out with her. And you can see at the same time, there are other kids like Rio or Amea. You can see Rio says, I most like to hang out with Joseph, Chris, Nathan. Not one single one of those children nominates Rio back, unfortunately. Now, this is a snapshot in time. And a lot of people say, well, you know, what kids are like friends one minute and then they're kind of a, uh, um, something happens and they're, uh, you know, they're, uh, they're, you know, enemies the next, uh, the next minute. And that's true. There is a lot of volatility in children's relationships. But you know what? You also find some patterns which can become quite entrenched over time. And unfortunately, one of the patterns that can become quite entrenched over time is that experience of peer rejection. And it becomes very difficult. And it's not surprising then that peer rejection is associated with mental health outcomes because those social difficulties can stay with a young person and have deeply emotional significance over not just a few days, but over weeks, months, and even years. And one of the things we need to think about is not just trying to figure out what's going on for that one individual, we need to also understand what's going on for the entire social context. And in order to do that, we really need to pay attention to all the things that you described in your presentation, Marcelo, what we might call social and emotional learning. And there's a huge amount of work that's been developed over the years, which frames social and emotional dimensions of learning as absolutely pivotal to what is happening at school. Um, the Collaborative for Academic Social and Emotional Learning, CASEL, presents social and emotional learning in terms of five different segments. You can see in the middle of this uh, uh, diagram here, self-awareness, self-management, responsible decision-making, relationship skills, and social awareness. But very importantly, again, these are not simply about skills that individuals are high or low on. This is also about understanding the social context within which those skills develop. 
in order to understand an individual's social and emotional skills in all of those areas, how they understand themselves, how they understand others, how they manage their relationships, how they regulate their emotions, how they regulate their behavior, all of those things, in order to understand them, we need to look at what's happening within the classroom. We need to look at school culture, policies at the school. We need to look at partnerships within the community. We need to look at the way in which families and caregivers are involved in the school as well. In other words, we no need to take a whole school community approach to understanding the development of social and emotional skills. This isn't just about identifying kids with problems and then finding some expert to sort those individuals out. It's about understanding the context within which we all have a role to play. And within that, I want to single out as a really important feature, one dimension of social awareness, which is this, empathy. So what do we mean when we're talking about empathy? Well, as you've heard, and no doubt explored many, many times during the uh, empathy conference, empathy is not just one monolithic entity. It's not just something that an individual is high or low at um, and uh, um, it, it's just sort of one attribute. Actually, there's multiple dimensions to it. And I, usually what you find when you look at the literature on this topic is people describe at least three different dimensions to empathy. One is an affective or emotional one, for example, put it in simple terms, feeling upset when a friend is sad. But it's not simply about being wrapped up in other people's feelings. It's also deeply cognitive, understanding what's going on with emotions, recognizing someone else's emotions and understanding what leads to a particular emotion. For example, why might someone be feeling upset? And then crucially, and this is the part that translates empathy into action, what we might call empathic concern or pro-social concern, wanting to help someone in distress. In other words, it's not just about being able to tune into someone else's feelings. It's about caring about that and wanting to make a difference. In other words, we are putting empathy into action. And once we do that, you can really see how empathy is a foundational force for social change. It's not surprising then that OECD has highlighted empathy as a key skill for 2030. Social and emotional skills, such as empathy and respect for others, are becoming essential as classrooms and workplaces become more diverse. This is a quote from the framework for uh, skills for 2030 from the OECD. And one of the questions we now have to think about is just what role is empathy playing in people's lives and how can we cultivate it and nurture it in children's development at school? I'm very pleased to have been very heavily involved in the new national curriculum in Wales. Uh, the curriculum in Wales is being developed now and just being rolled out after about five or six years of uh, intense development work with teachers, educators, and uh, whole school communities in uh, Wales. And one of the things I'm very pleased about is that now health and well-being is recognized as one of the six core areas of learning and experience alongside and at the same level as the humanities, literacy, mathematics, science and technology. And I'm very pleased also that expressive arts is also in there, again, at the same level. This is important because it tells us, just like I was showing on that first slide, that mental health, well-being, social relationships are not an added extra. It's not just about a few children who've got difficulties. It's not just a nice to have. It's absolutely fundamental to education in order to really promote the qualities, the skills, the attributes that all of us need in our everyday lives and children need as they progress towards adulthood to navigate the complexities of today's world. Health and well-being needs to be front and center, not just on peripheral thing, not just about a few children, Health and well-being is relevant universally for all of us, and the school system needs to take it seriously. Now, I talked before about empathy being a foundation for change. Well, that last dimension that I referred to, empathic concern or pro-social concern, is really critical because empathy turns into kindness in that way. 
And uh, uh, Marcelo, you talked about how I founded this uh, research center. Thank you for your very kind words on that. Uh, I am excited about it. This is an interdisciplinary research center that shines a light on the nature and importance of kindness and its impacts on people and communities. And it started with the work that I was doing in schools. Um, I was really thinking about kindness in schools and building a culture of kindness in schools. But what was interesting about it was that I quickly realized this wasn't just about the children. It's about all of us. Every one of us has a role to play. It's about the staff engaging with each other. It's about the organizational workplace that every school is. Really thinking about developing a culture of kindness that permeates the whole school community. And of course, as I started talking about that, doing research in that area and writing about it, I became very aware at the University of Sussex, which is a very interdisciplinary institution in its DNA, I think, um, I became very aware that colleagues in healthcare, in the medical school, in business school, in law and politics, in anthropology, in social work, colleagues from all of these different disciplines were thinking, huh, I haven't used the word of kindness in my academic work, but actually that really resonates. Um, I can get something very useful by looking at my discipline, my field of specialism through the lens of kindness. And so that's what we do. We have a wonderful interdisciplinary steering group that brings together people from loads of different specialisms to think about their area of work through the lens of kindness. Now, as you know, my focus has been on child development. And uh, I worked actually with some teenagers. Uh, this is with my PhD student, Jess Cotney, um, just getting teenagers' sense of what's going on with kindness. And what was really illuminating about that work I did about five years ago was just being able to shed light on the complexities and nuances of kindness, which teenagers were very, very attuned to. They understood that kindness wasn't just about helping someone or being uh, um, emotionally supportive. They also talked about really nuanced concepts like forgiveness, honesty, and inclusion. They recognize sometimes it's very tough to be kind. Sometimes actually being honest with someone about something very difficult was the right thing to do to be kind in the long term. And so you've got all these nuances about what's kind in the short term might not be kind in the long term. What's kind to one person may not necessarily be kind to other people. And it was really amazing that we had kids, you know, 13, 14 years old who are articulating these nuances. And one of the other things that they all reflected on was this point, that the impacts of kindness are not just about the receiver. It's not just a person who's experiencing kindness. They all suggested to me that actually the impacts of kindness are really profound for the person who's giving it as well. The person who's being kind gets something very fundamentally positive out of that experience. And that stayed with me and that has continued in our work. Um, and Marcelo, you referred to the project that I did in partnership with the BBC. Um, Claudia Hammonds is a wonderful BBC broadcaster and author. She's also a, a, a alumna of uh, Sussex University from psychology. And it's a, been a great pleasure to work with her on this project. We ended up with over 60,000 people from the general public taking the time to give us their thoughts on kindness through actually quite a lengthy online study. Um, and as Claudia said, when she was posting about this on social media afterwards, this is more people that have taken part in any of our studies before. This is in partnership with the BBC. You're all very kind. And it was true. People were very enthused about sharing their experiences of kindness. Now, I'm not going to go into detail on the amazing body of work that we uh, uh, did with this wonderful online study, but I did just want to highlight one thing, which is that those teenagers were absolutely right. Those teenagers I was speaking to in the, in the focus groups, they were absolutely right when they talked about giving and receiving kindness. Yes, receiving kindness was associated with well-being. We would expect that. But just as the adolescents had taught me, giving kindness was independently also associated with well-being. Now, from the study of over 60,000 people with the BBC, we also found one other dimension which had a unique independent contribution to understanding well-being, and it was this one, seeing kindness. We found that even seeing kindness, or let me put it this way, noticing kindness, was also independently 
associated with higher levels of well-being. What's going on there? We've got this extraordinary connection here of kindness being important, not just to the person who directly receives it, but the person who's giving it, and even to everybody else who is seeing it. Why? Because it is building our sense of being socially bonded, socially connected. It reminds us that our relationships really matter. This is the foundation for how we all progress. It's the foundation for how we all learn together, not as individuals in vacuums, but together. And it also is the foundation for how we all work. This is not just about kids. It's not just about teenagers. It's about every one of us. And in fact, when we asked people in the BBC kindness test how much they felt kindness was valued at work, actually, I was reasonably pleased with this. The mean score was 3.9 on a scale from one to five. So overall, across all these tens of thousands of people, people did feel that kindness meant something to them at work. It did have value at work. And interestingly, the highest scores were given by people in social work, healthcare, hospitality, and very relevant for our discussion today, education as well. Kindness really makes a difference. That's what the people are telling us. Now, that, please be, be aware of this, that does not necessarily mean that kindness is easy or that you always experience kindness from everyone around you. Of course not. Actually, sometimes social work, healthcare, hospitality industry, education, these can be the environments where it's very difficult sometimes to be kind because of a whole range of different pressures. But what the people were telling us in this study is that the kindness that does happen is extremely valuable. So the question is then for us to all think about how do we cultivate it? Well, I want to track you back a little bit. I want to go back to children and think about what can we do early on? Um, Marcelo also mentioned that I'm an expert advisor to Empathy Lab, which is a wonderful organization which focuses on books and stories as a vehicle for promoting kindness, for promoting empathy, for promoting social connections. And it's really interesting to think about how we can make use of books and stories in a way that boosts reading for pleasure, that boosts literacy for sure, but also boosts social relationships and well-being. And every year, and we have this coming up on June the 9th, if you're interested in the UK, we have Empathy Day, where booksellers, publishers, libraries, and schools up and down the country put a strong focus on the development of empathy through the power of books and stories. And in fact, this is an area that I'm very active in. I'm working at the moment with professors Jane Oakhill and Alan Garnham and our wonderful postdoctoral research fellow Sue Morris on a major UKRI, UK Research and Innovation uh, funded project on reading feelings. Does reading fiction improve children's empathy and pro-social skills. And what we found is indeed, there are links between reading and pro-social behavior, which are mediated by empathy. In other words, reading appears to be playing a potential role in boosting people's sense of understanding emotions, understanding other people's perspectives, understanding where people are coming from, and that reading and engagement with stories might then be a platform upon which pro-social behavior and kindness is built. And we've shown indeed in our experimental studies, these are all studies that uh, I've been uh, part of with my collaborators, conversations about stories can significantly improve social understanding. And that's what we've been finding in our studies so far. We've shown concurrent and longitudinal links between dimensions of reading ability and engagement on the one hand, and cognitive and affective dimensions of empathy on the other. And hot off the press, this is our most recent work, we've also been finding preliminary experimental evidence of the impacts of reading on pro-social behavior. So just further evidence that we shouldn't be treating the academic subjects like literacy, mathematics, history, all of the different academic disciplines, we shouldn't be treating those as somehow separate to children's social and emotional and psychological lives. They're very deeply connected. Uh, so what I want to end by is just asking you to ask yourself about the environments that you're working in, and particularly in the school context. 
Are you working in an environment that truly supports human flourishing? Does that environment support basic psychological needs? For example, we can ask the question using the perspective from self-determination theory about whether the environment meets fundamental human needs for autonomy, acting of your own volition, for competence, having a sense that you can make a difference in the world, you can get things done, you can make things happen. And fundamentally also the need for relatedness, that deep need that we all have for social connection, for a sense of belonging. What we have found is that in our research, and this is actually in the context of creative arts, what we've found in our research is that these are some of the ingredients that need to be there in order to meet those needs. There needs to be a sense of supporting young people's self-expression, their freedom of choice, validating their competence, not necessarily just wrapping people up in cotton wool and saying how wonderful they are, but actually giving them that sense of being able to make a difference in the world and being able to overcome challenges. Challenge absolutely needs to be there, but it's about finding that way through the challenge, making progress, going on that journey, and all within the context of social bonds a real sense of community. Once those ingredients are there in the classroom or in the workplace or in the community, that's when we can see people fulfilling their potential, realizing their ambitions and achieving everything that they are capable of. We teach a lot about this. We've got, I just wanted to do a little plug for this. We have a very, very unique online learn at your own pace course, a postgraduate certificate, which I think is unique in the world, is the psychology of kindness and well-being at work. And it's just a joy to work with students from around the world who join us online for this course, which enables people to really think about creating the workplace environments which fulfill people's needs, which meets people's needs to develop in a way that enables them to flourish. And so I want to leave you with this slide. How do we create that culture of empathy and kindness? That's what we try to do on that, uh, try to explore together in that uh, postgraduate uh, online course. But it's also what we all need to be doing in our everyday lives. We need to think about the whole community. This isn't just about a few individuals who have difficulties. This is about all of us. We need to be reflective and supportive. We need to show empathy and kindness to others and also direct it inwards to ourselves. This is not a trade-off. These two go hand in hand, and we've got to make sure that we're looking after ourselves just as much as we're supporting other people as well. And once we do that, in partnership with others, we have the opportunity to really make a difference in this world. Thank you so much for your attention. I really hope you enjoy the rest of this conference. Thank you. I can't thank you enough. I just wonder if you've got another couple of hours to keep going. <laughs> thank you very much. I'm, I'm happy to take any questions if there are any immediate things that anyone wants to ask about. Are there, are there any questions from the audience? Um, would you like, is there anything on the chat? Um, you know? That has come up. Would anybody want to raise their hands and say say anything at all i can see there are some points saying i would love to read more about the kindness and well-being research so maybe that maybe i'll be able to share some links later with people oh that would that will be that will be fantastic uh Robin. but i just i i can't remember sitting there enjoying uh words of someone so much um uh, every single word uh robin that you said every sentiment that you shared with us everything has been it's just so fundamental to um, to what the Global Empathy Conference um, aims and and its vision. Um, and you've gave you gave us so many things to think about. Um, and I love I just loved um, the number of connections between um, your presentation and um, and the thoughts I the thoughts I was sharing. Um, well, the, the, I can't believe the. The, when you mentioned the, the, the effect of the cognitive on the concern, which is also coming up in, in the student conversation, that sense of um, 
uh, using uh, an empathetic approach, but then act, acting on it. I, yeah. th I think that really reminded me of it. The, the effect it is the knowledge. You know, when I say knowledge to understanding to wisdom, the cognitive is the understanding, and the wisdom is the concern and the action, isn't it? It's just, it's just that it was such a close connection between the, the, the factors that I was um, uh, expressing, but all the things that you were saying, that that whole sense of, cre of the importance of creating the environments in which humans can flourish is so, so central to everything that we all do. Um, and those are the, the two circles that I showed in terms of um, the, the infrastructure that I set up in both schools is exactly that was absolutely based on um, uh, of establishing those communities uh, and um, and making sure that every individual family and students were able to flourish absolutely um, incredible I love the social grounds as well that was that's such a great um, thing for our uh, all our audience to um, uh, to take on board the idea of creating social grounds within within an environment is uh, gives you so so much um, insight and the the focus that you gave on the importance of relationships um, is just amazing. But most of all, your words, your vision, your work, and the uh, and and the potential for all of that to create social change is what I will take um, with me. So thank you so, so much. Uh, thank you very much. I, we much appreciate um, your sharing all your wisdom with us um, enough. Thank you so, so much. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. And thank you for all the really kind and lovely comments in the chat. I will share some links afterwards uh, with you, uh, with you, Marcelo and Sharmila, and hopefully that can be uh, circulated to the, uh, yeah. all the attendees. Amazing, amazing. Thank you so much, Robin, and enjoy the rest of the day for joining us. Thank you.